Hello and welcome to this edition of Quality of Life. I'm your host, Dave Augustine. Today we are talking about a special type of a program, if you want to call it. It's called Safe Haven for Babies. And joining us today, who's part of this, is Corey Selkirk. Hi there. Corey, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, this was a unique, I think this is a unique show that we're covering because I wasn't sure what to title it. You know, based on you know what you're doing, what you'll get into, I thought of just calling it Corey because it's I think it's such a unique thing right. that you're doing that you know I've never really heard about it. You know, as far as how it's going. So again, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and coming on the show and talking to us about it. It's great. So and it's good to see you again from yes, working absolutely. way back. So um, let's start out with your background. You know, what type of education have you had? Um, I attended Madison Area Technical College back in 1985, 86, and I graduated from there in 1988, and I'm a registered nurse, have been for almost 28 years. Nice. Are you practicing or nursing anywhere, or are you pretty much... Well, I don't actually, I'm not employed okay. um, at this point in time, but I practice my nursing quite a bit with Charlie, our baby that we have okay. at home right now. Okay. How about work history? As far as, you know, can you give us kind of a snapshot of where you've been and the type of nursing you have done? Okay. I worked in several different areas. We lived in Pennsylvania for the first 10 years of our marriage. And uh, while I was working there, I worked on several different floors, cardiac, uh, skilled nursing, um, pediatrics, oncology, worked hospice. And then I took 10 years off to hang out with my kids at home. I have eight biological children. And then about 12, 13 years ago, um, needed to go back to work. And mm -hmm. so started in maternity and found out very quickly that my work in hospice was carrying over to maternity just because there are families that definitely come in with outcomes mm -hmm. that they had not expected and the baby does not go home with them. Um, and so my work with hospice ended up carrying over to labor and delivery. Okay. When I got to work with you at St. Nick, which was very much a pleasure. Right. You created a program called HALO. Yes. Could you go into what HALO was all about? HALO, I created that. Um, I am a bereavement specialist, perinatal bereavement specialist, and those are nurses uh, typically that work with families whose babies have died either in the womb or shortly after birth. And HALO stands for Hope After Loss Organization because my desire in all of that was to provide some hope, mm -hmm. that it wasn't just about sad, that it wasn't just about tragic. Now that is definitely there, but it didn't just have to stay there. There could be some memories created during that time that would be cherished instead mm -hmm. of just looking back on it. And the whole blanket statement was that it was a horrible time. Um, and so some of the things that you do as a perinatal bereavement specialist are to walk alongside that family before that baby is delivered and afterwards. Um, you are there typically when the baby is born. You help create memories by um, assisting the parents with bathing that, that child mm -hmm. or uh, taking pictures. Blanketing and dressing a baby gives that baby dignity and makes them holdable. And it also was something that bereavement support, hospice support, in my mind, I mean, a family member has died. And typically with hospice, we think of someone who's 85 and maybe they have cancer and they um, have hospice support. But hospice really is for anyone who, mm -hmm. at any, anyone at any age. And that was something that my heart for hospice was carried into these families and the, that baby was deserved the dignity of being treated um, well and with loving care as well as that family and to walk alongside that family as they recovered afterwards and went mm -hmm. through the grief process and began to hope again afterwards, especially if, you know, if they had wanted to be able to have another child, to not walk through that next pregnancy absolutely terrified. Wow, what a powerful program and assistance yes. to help families with that. Yeah. So. And there, you know, you just have a nursing degree, but yet you're do fulfilling and doing so much more than just, right. you know, nursing. It's just basically coming down to the care, you know, being there, almost being one of the family and take them in. Yes, I had a number of families, actually, that I was there when their baby died, that in walking with their journey, with, through, with them through their journey afterwards, asked me to come and be there when their next child was born. 
And what they had said was that it was a comfort to them that I was there when their child had passed away and that they wanted me to be able to be there and rejoice with them sure. when they had an outcome which was one that they wanted. And so it was a little strange to have a bereavement nurse attending a birth for a baby that was not expected to have any complications. But when you have that kind of bond and you have walked through such a difficult time with them and you don't run away mm -hmm. when it gets so messy and right. when it's hard and most people you know, kind of, wow, I don't know what to say, and so I won't say anything, and, and they avoid them. And I had one IT guy who said, you know, typically IT person, people are, are not people people, and they don't know what to say, and so they have a tendency to just ignore the problem, mm -hmm. and maybe it will go away. Um, and uh, he said that he just really appreciated some of the people who got out of their comfort zone and said, I'm really sorry for your loss, and I really don't know what to say to you, but I care. And that is huge, I mean, because yep. there's nothing you can say to fix it at that point in time. Healing takes time, and um, I'm not there to fix it. I'm just there to make it a little less painful. Sure. Let's move into your family a little bit. Could you give us, you know, describe your family? Well, um, I am married to Mark, and we have been married almost 28 years. And uh, we have eight biological children, uh, Sarah, Jonathan, Joshua, Johanna, Charity, Mary Elizabeth, Andrew, Emily. And then uh, we have two kiddos that also bear our name, Emmeline, who died three and a half years ago after living for 50 days. And then we have Charlie right now, who is 20 months old, um, who is not expected he could die today. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know for sure how long he's going to live, but in the meantime, he's ours officially as of December. And then uh, we have three foster kiddos right now who are nine months old and <laughs> just wild. So yes, they are running and climbing and getting just getting into everything. Um, so we're very busy with household. I have four of my adult children who are out, and then we've uh, just brought the other four in. So we're back to ten living in our home right now. Wow. How does the family function or everybody support each other? You know, the mix, how do they all get along? Well, <laughs> I, you know, to be honest with you, there are just times when my kids look at each other. It's like, oh, somebody's coming over, so we should pretend like we like each other. <laughs> um, you know, they definitely scrap over, why did you take my shirt? And are those my pants? And, you know, my daughters took my eyebrow pencil that I needed yesterday and <laughs> couldn't find. So we are a very typical family. Not, we don't always like each other. We love each other, but we certainly do not always like each other. Um, I think that my children have been marvelously supportive of what it is that we do because this is not just my gig and mm -hmm. they stand back and go yay mom you know I mean we are we are a team everybody's out on the field and we are all playing nobody's yeah. sitting in the bleachers going yay mom go dad um, kind of business no this is we're all in until we're out and um, especially with Charlie uh, my children are his siblings and he is treated as such. It's not that right. he's this guest over there in that hospice bed. He is definitely part of our family. That's so nice. You know, such a yeah. nice story. Yeah. <laughs> as far as that goes. So you had mentioned foster parents. So your foster parents, how did that come about? Um, we are actually medical treatment foster parents. And how that came about was I got dreadfully ill a number of years ago mm -hmm. and it just finally hit a crisis point in 2011 and I was unable to go back to work and went through a number of surgeries and recovery and um, just got to the point where because of the damage done from those surgeries in order to fix other things um, parts of my body were broken mm -hmm. irreparably and uh, it made it socially unacceptable for me to go back to work which was horrible and uh, definitely something uh, devastating for me. And um, in all of that, I'll say that I hit a real low point because I just thought, I didn't think that my life was defined by my ability to contribute, but it certainly took a hit when uh, right. I was laying in bed and unable to do anything except get myself to the bathroom, and that was about all I did. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I started recovering health-wise, um, we got a call in August of 2012, and I had made it known. I was part of the Every Family Council here in Sheboygan, which is all, all the disciplines that contribute towards children and families. And I had made it known that if there were babies out there that mom, dad just could not deal, 
that we would be willing to take them. And mm -hmm. especially those with a life-limiting prognosis or terminal diagnosis, that was we don't do normal. I've done normal and they're scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, to take in that baby so that they had some quality of life before they died, that was something that was a dream of mine. Well, in August, I got this call that there was indeed a baby born without the right or left hemisphere of her brain. Only the brain stem was not anticipated to live long, but could li last until the age of two. Would we be willing to take her? It's like, I didn't even stop to think. Absolutely, yes, and everyone in my family was like, yes, let's do this, that's, that's wonderful. So uh, that was how we got into the journey of being medical treatment foster parents because that's really where my heart is at, mm -hmm. that's where our family's heart is at. This is a season that we will be doing foster care. I'm 50, my husband is 61. We don't sign up for a natural lifetime at this point in time, we're just too old for that. Sure. But we can certainly do intense short term and so um, in order to be able to be in the way to have children who might be in that situation mm -hmm. once they come up, in order to be able to take them in, then you have to be a, a foster parent. And so that's how we got licensed, so that we're there and available should children like this come up. Now, in the three and a half years that we have been licensed to do this, we've had two kiddos, so it's not like every day sure. there's another baby with a terminal diagnosis that does not have a family. Sure. So what you did is you were done with your health and it basically took away what you were used to doing and then you turned right. it around into something wonderful like this. Yeah. You know, so it's your way of contributing to keep your drive going, you know, so you can right. still contribute in the medical field, but it's more of just the medical field, it's the be well field, so to speak, where you can still. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that that was something that, there's a song by Sela. it may be unfulfilled, it may be unrestored, <laughs> but anything that's shattered, that's laid before the Lord, will not be unredeemed. And my life and my health was shattered. And I laid it out there in all mm -hmm. its mess. And if you will, I vomited it, all this yuck, at the foot of the cross and just said, God, you, you take it. I have no idea how you are going to redeem this, mm -hmm. but it's just beyond me. And now, you know, to, to look back, it's, I couldn't do medical treatment foster care when I was working. I just had no time right. <laughs> to right. be able to do that. And my husband said, no way. You know, you're working and we've got a big family to take care of. How in the world are we supposed to take a baby like that in? That's just not happening. And, um, how God ended up redeeming that and taking something that looked so devastating and so awful and turned it inside mm -hmm. out. So I won't even say that it was necessarily me. It was just God in my life said, this is what I want you to do and, mm -hmm. and graciously provided for me to be gimped enough <laughs> To be able to thrive at home and w with all this medical background, you know, sure. just washing dishes and, and doing laundry is something that I do on a regular basis. But I have that extra fulfillment in being able to take all that medical knowledge. And we have a home ICU set up mm -hmm. for Charlie. He's on a ventilator. Yeah. He has um, a pulse ox. He has a kangaroo pump for his feeding. You know, I mean, he's definitely high tech. And I, you know, my nursing background was invaluable to be mm -hmm. able to take care of him and be able to have a little bit more confidence in doing it. Definitely. Um, very similar, Sammy, my wife, you know, who had yes. a stroke and the same thing where she was used to going to work and doing all that. Well, she's found different ways to contribute. And that's the why same way we through just her volunteering. Are, so you two bond, yeah. I know, and keep up with each other on right. Facebook and such. So that's a wonderful thing. And we are just bonded in heart because both of us have been given lemons and we've learned how to make the best lemonade. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this side of the Mississippi. Exactly. So now we have Safe Haven for Babies. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me or tell our viewers, us, how that came about? Okay, so um, actually it really just sort of uh, came about as far as an official type of thing. The Sheboygan Press ran an article at the beginning of January and quite honestly, um, Children's Hospital had reached out to the media and said, you know, do you want to cover this family? Charlie's adoption was final and we could share mm -hmm. our story, you know, foster care and adoption. And um, 
so Milwaukee didn't want it. <laughs> And Sheboygan Press, actually, Leah, who came out, had only just graduated from Lakeland College a couple of days before, total newbie on staff. You know, they sent her out, sure. no photographer, just her cell phone, and um, she spent about two and a half hours with us. And that, honestly, and you're going to have to forgive me for this, but it was just a total God thing. Mm -hmm. Her mother had passed away. Um, Leah is only 21, and her mother had passed away in her 40s of mm -hmm. brain aneurysm only a few weeks before. And so when she came and wanted some understanding of how it is that you can deal with knowing this baby's gonna die. I mean, what kind of stability do you have to be able to roll with the fact that you are signing up for major heartache here? And how do you, how do, you do this? And to be able to talk with her, and I kept asking her, do you need to go? No, she had to plug her cell phone in and recharge it, et cetera. But we just had a wonderful time. She went back, and the article that she crafted, um, I think that they were going to run it like on a Thursday morning or something, and they opted to do it at the front page mm -hmm. and do it on a Sunday. And um, that went viral. And then Today.com picked it up, and they did another article. And then people, uh, they've done another article, and that will be out in magazines uh, tomorrow, Friday. And uh, it's the Ronald and Nancy Reagan is on the cover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that yes. is the one that has our article in it. So it was something that we are a safe haven for babies, especially those with a life-limiting prognosis or a terminal diagnosis. Um, there are thousands of people that would love to be able to have normal kiddos, you know, ones sure. that are, have no issues. Um, but we are special in the fact that we want to take those that perhaps no one else wants because they're just medically too complicated. And especially because their, their life is not expected to, to last for very long. And um, so Safe Haven for Babies is what we've called our website. And that is something that we're not a corporation. No. I'm, just, I'm just a family, but just I have thousands family. of people that are asking, how can I do this? So the website was just set up to answer that. This is how you get started. And your first step is to get started in foster care. You've got to be in the way so that when these kiddos come along, then you're ready and prepared to go. We have taken in two that are terminal, and we've had five others that are not. And we just kind of you know, nurture them and mm -hmm. help them get past the, the hump that they were in to begin with, and then they move on and are adopted or are re reunited with their families. I know with your first kiddo um, that you had and following you on Facebook, Sam, you getting Sam and you, and it was like, it isn't like you're just doing this to, okay, they're here. That, that person, that child's part of your family, because I remember seeing yes. the stories you put out there, wherever you guys went on a family trip, yep. there, there she was right along with you, you know, yes. smiling and everything else. And that's just, you know, such a wonderful thing to bring to them in their quality of life in their limited time. Right. Well, and we had a goal, you know, with Evelyn, we kind of have a, had a bucket list for her. And that mm -hmm. baby lived more in her 50 days, I think, than yeah. some people do in a lifetime. She got to go to a Winona Judd concert yep. at the Stephanie Wilde Center. We took her to the book, the bookmobile and the bank and the beach and have oxygen tank, have baby, we'll travel. We'll travel. That's yes. such a wonderful thing. Yeah. Where other people would just give up or. Yes. Well, and I, you know, I cannot say that there wasn't some negative. Um, feedback from that is like, why are you taking her out? You know, this makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but I am not going to hunker down in my home and only stay there because right. someone else might be uncomfortable with the fact that Emmeline was going to die. She had every right to live just as much as anybody exactly. else. And I wasn't like pushing her in anyone's face, but you know, to not take her any place because she was that fragile or because she might pass away while we were out. Charlie is the same deal. He yeah. could die on our way to church. He could die while we're at church. Um, we don't know where and when and where it is that he's gonna code, but I'll be hanged if we're just gonna sit at home and watch him until this happens. No, we're very busy about mm -hmm. living until he dies. We are living until he dies. We're not dying until he goes. Correct. And that's part of it, the whole experience, quality of life. Everybody has that right or that, yeah. you know, yes. desire to happen. So what drives Corey? How do you handle these emotional roller coasters up and down, you know, so considering everything you've been through already, yeah. I guess? How do you survive? I survive simply because God is my rock 
and my fortress and a very present help in time of trouble. And I make no apology for that. This is not because I'm a good person and it's not because I just have um, such a uh, strong spirit, etc. I will say I'm a steel magnolia. I am very soft and mushy, but I have a core of steel, and mm -hmm. there is just something that with these babies especially, in order to advocate for them, I have to be, I have to be fairly tough and just, you know, yes, they deserve this. And like with Emma Lynn, it was something that for her to have a quality of life, she needed some oxygen so that she was not struggling to breathe. And I was not trying to prolong her life, but I would not, no, she was not going to be sitting there gasping for air sure. when there was something that I could do about that. And so, you know what, I, I fought for that and, um, you know, just kind of went to bat and advocated for her. And I have advocated for Charlie. There are just some people who it's like, you know, what's the point? He's going to die anyway. Well, you know what? He is going to die, but he is not going to suffer any more than he absolutely has to if I have anything to say about it. Mm -hmm. So you have to be... My greatest asset and liability is that I'm a blockhead <laughs> and I'm stubborn. Yep. And, you know, I just, um, if, I, if I believe that something is right, then, you know, I'm just going to go after that. And I, I, don't, I don't pour into Charlie because he's going to give something back. That little buddy does not smile. His eyes don't light up mm -hmm. when he sees me. He doesn't giggle. He doesn't talk. He's never spoken a word. Um, I know that he knows that I'm there because he primarily has his head tilted to the right and he'll pick up his head and he'll turn to the left and he's always reaching out his hand and he wants you to yep. kiss his palm or he wants you to hold his hand. It's nice. like, I'm here, buddy. I will that's hold nice. your hand. And that's how we know that he's there. But you know what? He doesn't have to respond at all just because he has life. Mm -hmm. I make sure that it's the best life that he can possibly have and I don't pour into him because I expect to have returns, because I expect that he's going to pick up someday and he's going to walk and he's going to run. I'm hoping for that. You know, I'm mm -hmm. praying for a miracle. But if that does not happen, it doesn't mean that my efforts were wasted because I never saw any tangible um, sign that what we were doing for him was working to make him a productive citizen. He doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily contribute that way. His value is there because he's made in the image of God. And yep. so I just take that and it's like, all right, if I had the opportunity to do for Jesus, this is what I would do. And he said, if you do it for the least of these, then you've done it for me. Nice. A couple comments on, you know, some of the statements that you made, you know, your, your core is, you know, like steel magnolias, you know, that core yes. that keeps you working or going, i.e., your name fits, Corey. Yes. <laughs> because it's, yeah. you know, that core that keeps you driven and keeps you going. Yeah. Moving on, that's a wonderful thing. You know, the other thing, you know, about the time that Charlie will be, we're all going to die. Right. So nobody should suffer and everybody should be able to enjoy life to their fullest of what is out there, whether it's a very short lifetime or a long lifetime. Everybody deserves to live as full as they can. Yeah. It would be my thought. You know, as far yeah. as that goes. Yeah. So what about commitments that it takes, you know, for you to do this? I know there's got to be a lot of, obviously, family, personal commitments right. to adjust as well as financial commitments. Yes. You know, so like for advice for somebody who's maybe looking to do this, can you kind of paint the picture of the different types of commitments? I think financially it's not really um, a struggle that way. Um, because of going through the foster care system, et cetera. Okay. You know, he has state insurance, so that is not something that is costly for okay. us. Um, there is a small stipend. What is not covered is the 24-7, you know, emotional investment. Yep. My nursing skills are definitely, I, you know, I don't get paid to be his nurse. Um, you don't get paid to be a mom. And so taking on that commitment that I am going to be the mom that this child needs and not expect to get paid for it is... It's huge. Mm -hmm. um, there has to be an investment that I will take this child in and I will love this child as though they were biologically my own and that there will be no regrets that I could have loved you better. Um, Charlie doesn't need, uh, he doesn't need fancy, you know, he doesn't, uh, we don't travel with him, sure. you know, uh, that is something. I think commitment wise, that's one of the tougher things is the fact that for kiddos like Charlie and, and, and ones that are on hospice, you have to be willing to stay. Now, 
I got out this afternoon to be able to come and talk to you. But mm -hmm. typically, you know what, my my world revolves around my home, and I'm there pretty much 24/7 unless we're at the hospital uh, in Milwaukee. And it is something that you have to be willing to stay. Okay. Um. Do you have a website, or could you give us our, your website address if people want to yes. you know, go and look? www.safehaven4babies.org. -E okay, that's wonderful. Um, any other final thoughts before we wrap up? We have a couple minutes yet. I would say that the fact that Charlie and that Emma Lynn Emmeline died and mm -hmm. Charlie is going to die. It's something that's it's already set. I yep. can't change that. Can't change but what I have is the ability to influence whether or not the child lives. Mm -hmm. And that is a privilege. It is a heavy responsibility and not a light one, but it is such a privilege to be able to come alongside them and be a part of their life until they pass away. Okay. Um, again, I just have to say what a wonderful story you know Thank you. as far as you know somebody out there and willing to do this you know for these for these children to give yeah. them a chance to enjoy a little taste of that quality of life yeah you know it's it's just you don't see it every day something like this right you know and then i feel kind of special because i've got to work with you yeah. you know <laughs> even though this is all you know what you and right. your family have done but still knowing your capabilities of when we work together you know, yeah. how we supported each other that right. way. It's yes. kind of really neat. Um, what are the next steps? Our doors are definitely open for these kiddos with life-limiting prognosis, terminal diagnosis, and we will take in as many as God brings along and make sure that they have some quality of life before they pass away. And Dave, they are going to be good when mm -hmm. they get to heaven. It is just, yep. oh, they'll be fantastic. And Emmeline at this point in time is whole and well and her brain is not missing anymore and when we get to heaven and she comes running up and says, I know yep. you, that will just so make everything yep. worth it. Yep. And she's smiling down at you right now yes. saying thank you. So, yes. Corey, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show. Um, it's time for us to wrap, but okay. I just wanted to say again, thank you for all you do. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, for Quality of Life, I'm Dave Augustine. I'd like to thank you for watching. And if you have any questions or any suggestions, please contact us on our website at www.wscssheboygan.com. For Quality of Life, I'm Dave Augustine, and on behalf of Corey, thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.